Today's message is called Small Miracles. And I'll just tell you from the beginning, I don't think there's any such thing as a small miracle. But I, I think you'll see why I've chosen this title nonetheless. What I'd like to do is uh, go through two Bible stories and then a third one that's not precisely a story, but it's an idea. So three kind of biblical passages. I have a couple uh, testimony illustrations to share and then a conclusion at the end. And based on the time, I think we will be done uh, more or less according to where we were hoping to be done. So praise God. All right. The first story that we're going to look at is the one from which I took the uh, scripture passage from the book of Isaiah. The story here is that the king is going to die. Now, you probably know this story, but in, just in case you don't, the king is going to die. And the Lord actually tells him that he's going to die. He says, get your stuff in order because the end of your life is coming soon. So the king has a, um, an affliction of soul, so to speak. And he kind of, he, he almost begs the Lord. He says, Do, don't you remember? I have an upright heart and I've done this and this and this and this. And the Bible says he wept and he says, please, you know, prolong my life. So the word of the Lord comes to Isaiah and says, go tell the king that I have prolonged his life 15 years. Um, and then the, that's the context for which we got the scripture passage. The sign that God gave to confirm that the king will live another decade and a half is uh, what we read. It's the sundial going backwards. Now, when you read that story, and I'll... I'll put it on the screen in just a moment here, unless you guys want to go ahead a slide while we're waiting for the clicker. Okay, so uh, starting in verse 6, it's a verse before we already read, um, but God says, I will deliver you, king, and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken, for not only defend the city and fight off the Assyrians, but prolong the king's life at, at the same time. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. Now, when we read that, thank you, sir, it sounds... like a small miracle. Well, new batteries did not fix this problem, guys, so maybe we have to investigate this after worship. <laughs> you know what? If this is the worst thing the devil can throw at us this morning, praise the Lord. Well, one of them was backwards, but the other was not, and now they're fine, and it's still not working. So I'm going to put this down and let the AV team investigate after we're done. All right, that means you guys are on slide duty this morning. <coughs> okay, it sounds like a small miracle because, you know, nothing blew up. There wasn't like an angel that slays 180,000 soldiers. You know, nobody's raising from the dead. It's, it's kind of one of those things like you had to be there in that moment to see it or else it would just go by. But the reason that I don't think there's any such thing as a small miracle is because just put on your science hat for a moment. And if you take away the supernatural realm, the spirit world, and you think just materially, right, in terms of the rotation of the earth and the orbit around the sun and all the things that we know from the science world are true, what would it take to actually send the shadow backwards on the sundial, 10 degrees. That's when we realize this is not a small miracle at all, right? Because just materially, you take God and, and supernatural um, powers away, and what you would need to do is reverse the rotation of the earth so that the earth is spinning the opposite way, no longer... Um, going toward the east like it always is but now we're going toward the west like like the original superman movie in case anybody remembers that from the 1970s now obviously that doesn't happen the the sheer kind of inertia of that would 
Are you aware of how fast the Earth spins on its axis? It's incredibly fast. And if you were just to like arrest that and send it in the opposite direction, the inertia would rock, knock everything off the planet. And so how did God do this? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe he did that very thing. I have no idea. Maybe he just uh, affected the optics of, of the sunlight, you know, so that it, everything was normal except that moment. He just changed the way it perceived for the king and the witnesses. I don't know. It doesn't matter. My point for today is that if you were not there to see the shadow on the sundial, you'd never know. There's no announcement, no sky writing, right? No explosions. It was just this little itty bitty miracle given just for the people who were present. And then of course you and me who get to read about it in scripture, but in the heat of the moment, it's just a little miracle. Similarly, if you go to my next slide, please, out of Judges 6, <clears throat> this is another familiar story, Gideon and the Fleece. Uh, if you are not familiar with this story, um, the nutshell version of it is that Gideon, well, Israel has been persecuted for some time and God shows up to this man Gideon and says, get your stuff together because you're going to go save Israel. And Gideon doesn't believe it. In fact, he responds by saying, I don't believe it. <laughs> My, I am the smallest clan in Manasseh, which is a pretty small tribe. What, what do you mean that I'm going to lead Israel to success. And so God shows up in the form of an angel, I think, if I remember correctly, and kind of sets Gideon's heart at ease at first in terms of this is truly what God wants. But then, because Gideon's human, even though he has had it confirmed already, the doubt creeps up in his heart. And so he says, all right, God, well, I still need another confirmation. So let's read the passage here. Gideon said to God in verse 36, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. So there's more, but I'm going to stop here because it's worth pointing out once again, Gideon already knew the will of the Lord. And so we often kind of colloquially use this story um, to illustrate when we need to determine the will of the Lord. You're like, oh, I don't really know what to do. I'm not sure what God wants me to do. And then someone in the group inevitably says, put out a fleece, right? But that actually misses the whole point of the story because Gideon already knew the will of God. He's asking for a confirmation. He's not trying to determine what God really wants. He just wants the doubt to go away. So that's number one to point out. Number two, look at that nasty little word, that two-letter word that he begins with, if. If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. As you have said, if you actually meant the words that came out of your mouth, God, then do the following. And so, isn't God good? Gideon is showing up here not with faith. He didn't believe what God said the first time he said it. He didn't permanently believe God when he showed up in the form of an angel to confirm it. So he's showing up now like needing a second round of confirmation and he's beginning by if. I am not entirely sure that everything you say is true, God. But just in case it is, please confirm it in the following way. And so that's kind of a condemnation of Gideon's lack of faith, but it's mostly in my mind an exaltation of the goodness and the grace of God that he does not hold our weakness against us. Amen. All right. So it goes on from here. He has put out the fleece and he says, when I wake up in the morning, have it be totally wet, but the ground is totally dry. And that happens. Oh, I'm sorry. Go to the next one. <clears throat> and it was so when he rose early uh, the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And then Gideon said to God, recognizing that he is just totally immersed in his lack of faith here. Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. 
Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all of the ground, let there be dew. And then go one more. Verse 40, and God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all of the ground. So this is a pretty impressive miracle. Again, not just because of the miracle itself, but because God is so good he, and patient and long-suffering and willing to put up with Gideon, needing not one or even two, but three confirmations that God meant what he said in the first place. But it's a pretty small miracle, isn't it? It was just a little fleece. How big do you think it was? Not very big. He wrings it out, a bowl full of water. But if it's like a poofy kind of a fleece, you don't need it to be very big for that. And Gideon is apparently the only one who noticed it, the only one who witnessed it. At least scripturally speaking, he's the only character present. And so if you're not there to see the miracle, you miss it. And what would have happened if God had performed this miracle without Gideon asking him to? And that's not what happened in the scripture. I'm just saying, what if? What if God had done this moisture miracle with the fleece and Gideon didn't even notice? Do you think maybe it's possible that God does these small miracles in our lives and sometimes we don't even notice? So let me share a testimony with you. <coughs> this is going to take us all the way back to 2010, probably. So it's been 12 years. And I'm working with Amazing Facts. I'm in Sacramento. And we are, our task for the day is to give out books. If I remember correctly, I think it was Great Controversy, but don't quote me on that. So we were just turned loose on the streets of Sacramento and our only job was get rid of all of your books. <laughs> okay. Which not to throw them away. I mean, get rid of them by giving them to a person. But it was raining. And not only was it raining, it was raining badly. It was coming down, straight down with some violence. And simultaneously, it was also going like straight across. The wind was such that you were getting hit with heavy rain from two different directions, and it was a mess. And if those conditions were, go were to persist, it would absolutely prevent us from doing what we believed the Lord wanted us to do on that day. So we prayed about it. And I walked into that prayer circle, I'll confess to you, with a complete lack of faith, thinking, this is nuts. It's like a hurricane outside. And... We're going to say some words into the air and God is going to arrest this entire storm and make it clear for us. Good luck, right? But I'm thankful today that God is greater than our lack of faith, just like with Gideon. And so we had the prayer circle and people with greater faith than me at the time um, prayed the right prayers and we said in Jesus name, amen. And then it was still raining. But we went about our work as if it was not raining. And we opened the boxes and distributed the, the books to the teams and formed the teams and arranged the rides and all that stuff. And wouldn't you know it, by the time we were actually ready to get in the cars and go, the rain had stopped. To my great surprise, the rain had completely stopped. So now we're out there on the streets of Sacramento. We're giving away books. Jack Nicholson was out there on that day. Met Jack Nicholson giving away books to <laughs> on the streets of Sacramento. Um, and now my partner and I are the only ones left. I think that's because we wanted to always give the book to an actual living human being and others were content to like leave a stack of books on the mailbox, you know, but that's just my speculation. For whatever reason, we were the last team that still had books to give away. And so <laughs> I really want to get done. You know, I'm trying to find person. Hey, do you want this book? Do you want this book? Do you want this book? My partner finishes. Now I am literally the last one in the entire team. I've got like two books left. So I'm walking up to a bus stop over here. I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm giving away these free books. Would anybody like a book? 
Oh, what's the book about? It's a, it's a history book about uh, uh, the Christian history of the church. Okay, okay, I'll take it. All right, so I give away my last two books. Now I'm done. And the rendezvous point where we're meeting everybody to get back in our cars and leave was probably a block and a half that way. So I, I turn and I'm heading over to meet everybody else. And wouldn't you know it, as I step one foot into the parking lot, the rain started again in that moment. And I said, Lord God, forgive my unbelief. You paused this gale storm because we asked you to. And you paused it literally just long enough for us to finish the work you gave us. And as soon as it was over, you brought the storm back. I said, Lord God, forgive me and take away this unbelief and never, ever let it come up in my heart again. You are clearly the God of all flesh. You are clearly the God of all nature, and you can do as you have said that you're going to do. Hallelujah. Similarly, later on that year, my wife and I went down to uh, Brazil as part of a mission trip, and that was really fun. And while we were there, we were working outside Primarily because there was a church building, but it was under construction. The, the church down there was expanding and building, and it was mostly just a construction site. So we were there to do many things, one of which was to do like a VBS for two weeks to get all the kind of neighborhood kids and teach them about Jesus. And we had to do that outside with the only shelter was like a, like a, a metal canopy that was, you know, so big by so big. And if we needed shade or anything, that was where we went. Otherwise, we were completely outside. And even that canopy had no walls. So it was just like a roof. It rained while we were there literally every single day. And yet it never once rained on our heads. It was incredible. And you can ask Marina. She'll testify too. God would like, it would not be raining and we'd walk from where we were staying down to the church area, and then we'd like, you know, get in our working area under the canopy, and then it would start raining. And then it would stay raining the whole time while we're working with the kids, and now it's lunchtime or whatever, and it's time to go somewhere else, and the rain would stop. And then we'd like successfully go eat lunch or whatever we needed to do, and then come back for the afternoon, the rain would start again. As soon as we were not actually exposed to the rain, God would let it rain. And anytime we had to actually go away from the shelter, he would stop the rain. For two weeks, this happened. It was absolutely incredible. And yet, how many people down there do you think noticed it? I mean, I don't want to say I was the only one, but I was certainly the only one I knew of who mentioned it. Like, have you noticed for like seven days it's only been raining when we were not exposed to the rain? <laughs> So God did a small miracle that was really a big miracle, but it seemed like a small miracle, and a lot of people missed it. What do you think? You think maybe God does these kinds of miracles more often than we realize, and they just kind of go right by us and we don't notice? And so our third passage from the scripture today is from 1 John 2.20. And uh, there it is. In my humble opinion, this is just about the greatest small miracle that we can expect. Scripture says, but you have an anointing. And in the original King James, that says an unction. And I like that word better. It's like God is elbowing you in the ribs. You have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. Have you ever been totally humbled by the idea that the creator of the universe is telling you what's about to happen in the future? Have you ever had that experience? I have, um, ever since 2007, I have had a recurring experience where God lets me know when a period of transition is coming. 
And I think that's because 2007 was a period of transition and I knew it. And I said, God, show me what to do because I have no idea what to do. You got to do something, but I'm, I don't even know. So I'm not even telling you what to do. Just do it and bring me along for the ride. And ever since then, when I, I, and I've told this story many times, but the way I concluded that prayer that I prayed every day for several weeks, maybe even a couple months, was when you speak to me, do not overestimate my ability to hear you. I am a man of a thick skull, and I am almost guaranteed to miss what you tell me unless you do it loudly and in a way that I will not miss. So, Lord, speak to me in that manner. Amen. And ever since then, I'll tell you, I don't always know what's coming. In fact, I rarely know what's coming. But that feeling that we're in a transition moment has has been right on every single time. So you may remember like a month ago from the pulpit, I had a whole message called transition. The whole purpose was to prophetically, hopefully demonstrate we're in a time of transition right now. Well, guess why I thought that? Sure, I know prophecy, but mostly it's because God put that feeling on my heart like a year ago. We are in a time of transition right now. Now, we're here at 9.30 in the morning. We're hearing the sermon before 11 a.m. And so it's obvious to everyone in the room right now that we're in a period of transition because this is a transition. This is not the norm. I don't think you need me to point that out. But as we go through this corporate transition, our homework is to listen, to watch, to have our hearts open for these small miracles which again are not small at all, but those things that maybe God is showing just to you. Maybe that idea God gives to just your mind or that feeling he puts in just your heart or that irregular movement of a shadow that only you see. Don't let those small miracle moments go by because I believe the Lord is trying to communicate to us. We don't all listen the same way but we are all one body of Christ. So just because only you hear it, maybe that means because the Lord needed you to then share it with the rest of us. So let's not let these small miracle moments go by. But, and here's my final thought. I don't think we're just in a moment of corporate transition. I don't think that's really God, how, how God works most of the time. <laughs> I think when he works, he works in the big picture. And when he wants to change things, the whole world changes. So, yes, your church is changing right now, but maybe you are as well as an individual. So while you're keeping your eyes and your ears and your heart and your mind open to these small miracles for your church, Try to stay open for the small miracles in your own individual lives as well. And if we all do that, I left this, uh, this verse on the screen on purpose. If we all expect an anointing or an unction from the Holy One, if we all believe He can teach us things that we didn't already know from on high, supernaturally to communicate with us in that manner. And if we stay open to that, oh, not only do I think we're going to go these next two months and clearly understand the will of the Lord <laughs> to, to know what to do in November and beyond, but further than that, I think we'll all just be different people. As, as the Lord changes us individually, you know, we, we pretend that two months from now, our big decision is going to be, do we go back to the old schedule or keep the new schedule? But I actually kind of think it's bigger than that. I think two months from now, a lot of us may be totally different. And as these different people in Christ come together, we're going to hear the voice of the Lord differently. And maybe we'll act differently. But our homework between now and then is to stay open to these small miracles. If you can go to the last slide, please, which is just a picture. But let's stay open to the small miracles because Christ, 
I, I picked this picture because it's Christ, of course, but he's in the field of just flowers with trees in the background. These are everyday situations. But do you think God can do a small miracle through the flowers, through the weather, through the trees? Of course he can. So let's look out for Jesus. Let's listen for Jesus. Let's have a heart for Jesus, even in the everyday things. And by the grace of God, a couple months from now, everything might be totally different to the glory of God. Do you think you can do that? Keep your feelers up for those small miracles for at least the next couple months. Although I'll tell you, really, until Jesus comes is the right answer. But at least for the next couple months, can we stay sensitive to the small miracles of life? Willing to do that? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for being greater than our selfishness, greater than our blindness, greater than our disbelief and unbelief. Thank you for being patient with us as you were patient with Gideon and for being loud with us because you know we are inclined to miss what you say. Right now, Lord, to whatever extent we are able, we are giving you our hearts. And if we're not able, then we're asking you to take our hearts. And Lord, change them, open them up, turn them into a reservoir of blessings from heaven so we can hear you and see you clearly and follow you confidently into whatever you have waiting for us. Bless us, Father, in the name of Jesus with as many small miracles as it takes to wake us up and put us on the path you want us to be on. We thank you. And we ask you to bless us as we transition now into the Sabbath school portion of the morning. Lord, give us, give us wisdom now and always. In Jesus' holy name, amen.